quickly, our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. Okay, guys, welcome back to this week's Grime America. Uh, a little late, sorry about that. Um, but we're going to be talking to Antonio Paris a little later. He's the founder of aerialphenomena.org. Um, but first, as always, with me is Graham. How's it going tonight, Graham? Uh, I'm not doing too bad, Darren. Yeah, looking forward to uh, getting this episode out. Yeah, and then uh, next up, we're going to have our, our call-in episode where we talk to uh, a couple of the fans of the show and uh, a couple of past guests and and, uh, and a couple of little tidbits for you guys. So uh, it'll be a two-episode week. Yeah, yeah. Instead of putting it all together in one, we thought we'd split it up. Um, we did get a new blogger, Jared Grace, one of our listeners, has decided he's going to come on and blog with us, so we're pretty excited to have that. And of course, as always, big thanks to the bloggers we have. And anyone who's looking to get into blogging, you know, shoot us an email because um, we want to kind of turn American into a, a home for bloggers as well. And feel free to, to shoot us an email if you're interested. Yeah, and that leads me to uh, the new site, right? You you kind of cleaned up the site a bit, right? Looks Looks good. Yeah, I'm starting to figure out WordPress, so it's getting a little bit better. And it's kind of just more podcast blog related instead of showing a bunch of news stories and all that, right? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah, if, if you're listening to this and uh, you haven't seen the new site, check it out. And also uh, like us on Facebook. That's going good too now, right? Yeah, Facebook is picking up. It's starting to catch up to the Twitter. I think it's about 25% of the way there, so... Head on over to Facebook, give us a like. You can find us at Grimerica as well on Twitter. And we'd like to say hi to a new fan in Latvia. Yeah, we uh, busted into Latvia, so hello our, to our Latvian fan. Welcome to Grimerica. Do you know Artur Zerbe? He's one of my favorite NHL goalies. <laughs> San Jose Sharks? No, he. I don't know, wasn't he? He was a Canuck for a while, Vancouver Canuck. Yeah, I think he's... I think he was a San Jose Shark for a while, too. I could be wrong. Who knows? I thought there was a couple of Latvian goalies, too. I think they, those Latvians were, were producing some good goalies for a while there. That's where uh, Ed Leedskelnen is from, too. And? That's the guy who created Coral Castle. Oh, yeah, right. Oh, we got to do an episode on that. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I'm halfway through the book... Um, Waiting for Agnes. It's written by Joe Bullard, and he's kind of a it's kind of a novel, a novel based on it. But he's a researcher that that's looked into it quite a bit. So I'm, I'm gonna try and get in touch with him and see if we can't get him on in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, and no, for those of you who don't know what Coral Castle is, you should just maybe throw it in the show notes. It's pretty pretty cool uh, place. Buddy said he uh, knew the secrets of the. The makers of the Great Pyramid and Stonehenge and so on and so forth. Sound levitation? Yeah, maybe. Vibrations? No vibration. <laughs> Good vibration. <laughs> and speaking of vibrations, uh, I'm reading that book, uh, Energy Medicine Technologies, and I'm really fascinated by that. It's, it's really cool. Yeah, I haven't, I'll have to bust into that. Um, and for those of you who can't find the time to read books, you know, um, you can always head over to audibletrial.com forward slash Grimerica and get your free free trial, free month, uh, free audio book and give it a listen. And if you, if you decide to stick around, then uh, it's a good way we get a little kickback and it's a good way to support the show. Um, and they got some great books. Have you busted into your uh, Tesla one yet? No, no. I'm still trying to really read a book. But there's also more than books too, right? There's old lectures and all kinds of old, like if you're interested in political speeches or all kinds of crazy stuff like that, I think Audible's just continually expanding their library. Yeah, it's a great thing. I actually, uh, one of the ones I, I listened to recently was the Chrysalids. I can't remember who the author is. I'd have to look it up, but it's kind of a novel based on like, um, I, or I don't want to give too much away, but it, it's a, it's a great book. That's a fantasy type, isn't it? Or yeah, it's kind of prophetic fantasy, I guess. Huh? I think I read that when I was younger. Yeah. I think you might've had to read it in school actually. Oh, ah. um, so I suppose that about wraps it up. We'll keep it short and sweet and, um, uh, pop into our interview here with Antonio Paris. You got anything else you want to get out there, Graham? 
No, no, it's just a great chat with uh, Antonio. Lots of nuts and bolts uh, research talk, but he's really open minded. We chatted about all kinds of different stuff, so that'll be good. Guys, tonight on the Grimerica show, we'll be talking with um, Mr. Antonio Paris of aerialphenomena.org. Uh, but first, with me as always is Graham. How's it going, Graham? Hey, I'm doing pretty good tonight, Darren. Looking forward to chatting with Antonio. I'm just going to read a little bio here of Antonio. He's uh, the founder and director of Aerial Phenomena, and he's a, U- a former U.S. Army counterintelligence officer and Department of Defense counterintelligence special agent. He was awarded the Bronze Star for Combat Ops in Iraq during Operation Iraqi Freedom. And today, Antonio works for the science tech and engineering from firm Science Applications International Corp, ISR in Space Operations, and that's a cl- for a classified client in Washington, D.C. He's got a Bachelor of Science in Computer Information Systems, uh, Master's of Science in Planetary Science, Additionally, he's a director and founder of the Center for Planetary Science. That's a science outreach program bringing astronomy, planetary science, and astrophysics to the next generation of space explorers. It's all good stuff we're interested in, anybody? Yeah, no doubt. (laughs) And then, uh, moreover, he's a member of the Washington Academy of Sciences, the National Capital Astronomers, is a member of Board of Advisors for the International Space Agency, and has appeared in dozens of radio shows, webcasts, and cable interviews, including consulting work for the popular TV series Unsealed, The Alien Files. And he's, he's the author of a book called uh, Aerial Phenomena, Reviving Ufology for the 21st Century, and the director and producer for the popular documentary Area 51, A History of This Reclusive Base. So this is the, some of the stuff we're going to be talking to Antonio about. Welcome to the show, Antonio. Hey, guys. Thank you for having me. Um, it's quite an honor, uh, you guys reaching out to me, and I can be in this cool podcast with you guys. Yeah, we'd like to really thank you for coming on. Um, you got a great website. Um, I must admit I haven't read the book yet, but I definitely plan to. Um, so basically... As, as always, as always, um, I always give a free book to uh, guys who interview me. Wow. So after the show, shoot me an email uh, with your uh, P.O. box or mailing address, and I'll send out a copy this weekend. Oh, that's awesome. great. Thanks. Do you sure de- no deliver to igloos at all? We're, we're broadcasting from, <laughs> from an igloo in Calgary. That's kind of I've hard. delivered all the way to Australia, so <laughs> okay. if they can get it, I guess you guys can get it. <laughs> so I guess the, for, for some people who aren't familiar with your, with your work and what you're trying to do, can you kind of give us the, the rundown on exactly what uh, reviving ufology for the 20th, 21st century means? Yeah, um, let's go back a couple of years first and how I got the idea. So I've always was interested in UFOs um, and the search for extraterrestrial life. And I always wanted to study UFOs uh, as an investigator. So what I did before I started this, for for two years, I went around and went to different conferences, you know, MUFON, uh, the big one in Phoenix, uh, International UFO Congress, all the local UFO meetings, et cetera. And I quickly realized that most, if not all, of these organizations and meetings uh, really dealt with more than just UFOs. They were they were swamped with things, uh, including Bigfoot, Loch Ness monster, Chupacabra, conspiracy theories, uh, all these things that that I think give ufology a bad name. And I decided, well, that's not the road I want to really take. I wanted to study. 
uh, UFOs from a scientific, kind of a Sherlock Holmes perspective. So I quickly knew that these organizations uh, would not be able to offer me that. And I decided to just do my own thing. Um, so I did I did what most people do. I, I uh, joined MUFON just for the, for the initial kind of training. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have a really good training program. Uh, I did the investigator training, the starching training, things like that. But I, I just use that as a catalyst to start my own organization. And while I was doing this, I also looked and recruited for like-minded individuals, people who who, who are really interested in UFOs, but are are from a nuts and bolts perspective. Really, don't don't really care about uh, the the alien agenda. What's their purpose here? Conspiracies, all these things. And we wanted to look at UFO reports. What is it that people are seeing? What is it that they're reporting? And more importantly, can can we analyze the data? You know, we're 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 not out chasing every wild, you know, wild story of UFOs. We have a very strict uh, investigative criteria. You know, we we get dozens of reports uh, a week, and we don't have obviously the time manpower to investigate all those. So we're really looking for good UFO reports. Um, and quickly, I just want uh, you know those reports would include multiple witnesses, a daytime sighting, uh, some type of physical evidence, whether mm-hmm. it's a photo or video. Mm-hmm. But more importantly is something that's recent. You know, we get a lot of UFO reports that are 20, 30, 40 years old, no photos, uh, vague memory. And that's not the thing. That's not what we want to do. There yeah. are organizations that do that, you know, MUFON and New Fork. That's yeah. good. That's good for them. That's their mission, but that's not our mission. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally understand that, uh, that part of it. So, um, so tell us about some of the latest uh, cases that you've had. Then we, we we've gotten we've gotten about let's see in the last two years we're coming up on our two year anniversary uh, here in December, and we received close to about four hundred uh, UFO investigations reports, and out of those four hundred, we investigated about three hundred. And out of those 300, I would say probably about 75 were really good cases where they met all those criteria. Mm-hmm. But out of all those cases, we 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 have a really good investigative process and tools, and we were able to identify most of those cases. You know, things like uh, natural phenomena, uh, man-made aircraft, uh, advanced you know technologies, R and D stuff. And I'd say about maybe three to five percent of the cases were closed as unidentified. We we were not able to identify those cases, um, even though we had credible witnesses, multiple witnesses, mm-hmm. uh, some type of photo. Mm-hmm. So uh, contrary to what people think, you know, that we are, uh, sometimes they call us debunkers. We're not because we have a really good number of handful of cases that we we closed as unidentified. We just don't know what it is. Um, and we need, and we close them unidentified. We can't lean to yeah. the conclusion yeah. that it's extraterrestrial. You know, we have no, no proof of that either. Yeah, yeah. Um, and these cases range from uh, really good cases about alien abductions. Um, we get a, a good handful of of your famous black triangle cases here. You know, things that are like uh, size of a football field, uh, relatively quiet. Um, and we get those recently uh, in the last couple of months from credible witnesses. We're talking yeah, about, you yeah. know people that work uh, at high levels here in DC huh. um, and and you know and we get we get a lot of, of, of strange orbs uh, moving in erratic patterns and things like that also from from credible witnesses yeah. so those are really good cases that we just don't know what are they, what they are yeah so do you think that the uh, that five percent that you always hear um, you know 95 percent is explainable to something and then there's that five percent left over do you think your numbers kind of fall within that five percent? They, they, they are initially the case. Initially, about a year ago, we were about at the eighty-eight percent threshold. Yeah. Um, and then the other were unidentified. But as we looked at better cases, better data, we started getting close to that ninety-five. We're, yeah. we're more like at ninety-eight percent. Yeah. Um, and that's just I think that's because our data pool is not as big as others. Yeah. Right. Um, and you're already weeding out a lot of the other ones too, right? Cause you're are, starting, you're starting are. with a smaller sample. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. when, I, when I, I was with MUFON for two years, uh, so obviously I investigated their cases and as a, a star team member as well. 
And we get a lot of data. You know, they don't triage their cases like we do. You know, a case opened up, light in the sky 10 years ago. Uh, they want you to investigate that. And we yeah. do that as best as we can. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and we put as much due diligence as possible in those cases. But, you know, most of those cases tend to be unidentified or, or historical cases only. Yeah. That's what we're trying to stay away from. Um, and I think the message is getting out, um, you know, about who we are, what we do and what we don't do. Uh, and the team is growing. Initially, it was just myself. And now we're up to 14 investigators mm -hmm. uh, with a couple of them international. Very and, cool. and, and I think we don't want to grow that big either. We're no, not here no, no. to compete with anybody. We're not here to replace anybody. Um, people keep asking me, well, why your own organization? Why, um, why not be part of MUFON? Why not dissolve and, and be part of MUFON? Um, and, I, you know, I always respond with, you know, I, I see MUFON like a McDonald's. They're everywhere. Um, I don't want to be that McDonald's. I want to yeah. be that little mom and pop burger that sells really good burgers, you know. And, <laughs> I and thought you were going to see like the, you want to be the <laughs> high-end steakhouse or something, but. No, no, no. I just want to be that 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 uh, uh, that special small team of investigators that only look at special cases, kind of uh, like a, a, a you know a special squad in a in a larger police department, things like yeah, that. Yeah. So um, so you mentioned that that part of the category of your identifieds was like R and D stuff or kind yeah. of like high tech man made made objects. So how do you tease that out? Well, and, and identify that it's man made. Well, here's a good example. Um, here in Maryland is where we're based, and we're very close to the Patungston Naval Air Station, and that's where the X-47B is is uh, is being tested, that new drone. Yeah. So that's a good example. We get a lot of cases of these small triangular crafts, you know, uh, in the vicinity of Patungston with, you know, uh, you know, and as we as we start asking questions, well, they'll start telling us the size, approximate size, um, the vectors, which direction it was coming through. Um, also, the, you know, if it had navigation lights and things like that, we can weed those things out. Um, and for the most part, uh, uh, the X-47B is not really classified anymore. So uh, a couple of local phone calls uh, to the airbase usually answers that. Right. And, uh, you know, yes, it was flying out. Uh, they won't tell you specifics, obviously, but no. uh, or mission requirements and like that. But uh, for the most case, uh, you know, you sit down with the witness and and we also have a nice little library of just thousands of photos of different types of aircrafts. And then we started weeded down that way. Yeah, that's a great um, that's a great section of your website. The black and, tri the black triangle yeah. page and the man made photo page is, is great. Yeah, and yeah. you know, I, I weed things out like, um, yes, it had green and red navigation lights. You know, there's no reason for aliens to have FAA navigation lights and things like that. Um, That'd or be a pretty if, big coincidence, <laughs> unless they're in or, disguise. Or, yeah. or vectors. You know, uh, aircrafts. You know, for the most intestine purpose, for the most you know most part, aircrafts in space in the air have highways called vectors, and they need to stick to those vectors. So if a if a tell if a witness tells us the aircraft was flying in this direction, um, there are several websites out there, uh, in, including one called skyvector.com, and it can tell you uh, what plane was flying in that vector at a certain time. Uh, but we need to hurry up because a lot of these websites uh, only hold data for 30 days, and then oh. you have to go through the FOIA requirements oh. and stuff like that. Yeah. Hmm. Um, so that's why we don't like to do cases that are too old because then it's just a FOIA nightmare. Yeah. So um, have you had any any backlash in your professional life due to this uh, UFO work? or? No. Um, for the most part, I separate the two. Um, at work, you know, people know I'm an author and I investigate UFOs on the side. Uh, on, uh, you know, they'll have the giggle factor and things like that. And, and when I come home, it's just... You know, I do what I do. I don't mix the two. I don't use my clearances at work to look for UFOs or look for <laughs> top secret stuff because that's tracked and I'll go to jail. Um, uh, the It's actually the reverse. The reverse um, uh, people in ufology or these, these uh, you know, UFO niches and cults, 
look at me as um disinformation you know, disinformation amen that i've been labeled a men in black you know antonio's been counterintelligence for you know 20 years yeah they yeah. um th you know those are people that just don't really know what they're talking about uh you know i'm a patriot i love my country i served uh, you know i served in three wars um but uh and that's it that that's it and um in the second part this is a hobby for me and for the most part, um, I go to conferences and that's educating, you know, educating people. You know, I always talk about my bio, mm -hmm. uh, what I do, what I don't do. Um, and usually that works out well. Well, I think that's a bit of a shock for people when you do, when you look at your bio, when they read your bio and, and you see your, you know, intelligence background and some of that, it is a bit of a shock and it's good. It's good it to is. see, it's good to see people like yourself involved in this now to open it up a bit, you know, maybe bring some a different uh, slice of credibility to the mainstream science and media. What I notice is that that's, uh, it's a bit of a shocker that that's all they concentrate on. You know, he's a spook or, you know, he worked for CIA. And they don't really necessarily look at my other credentials. You know, I have a uh, background in computer science, a background in uh, planetary science. Mm -hmm. um, I also have a, uh, a small nonprofit called Center for Planetary Science, uh, reaching out to kids uh, so they can embrace science and astronomy and, 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 and shape these kids and so they can work for NASA or be astronauts in the future. Um, they don't really want to look at that kind of stuff. For some reason, the, 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 the second you mention top secret and you work at the Pentagon or something, that's what they want to focus on, you know. And, and, and unfortunately, those topics have derailed ufology. You know, uh, it's sad that I go to these local conferences um, you know, including MUFON, which they're supposed to be talking about the uh, the uh, scientific investigation of UFOs for mankind, but there, I don't see any science really. You know, um, I'm hoping that the new guy, the new director Jan ha uh, Harsan, can uh, recalibrate their compass and mm -hmm. move back in that direction, and not talk about CIA remote viewing conspiracies and uh, you know alleged top secret meetings with aliens from another planet that, that those things are silly and it's it's for those reasons that uh books on ufos are not in the science section at your local bookstore they're always at the uh the occult section uh the voodoo section and things like that um mm -hmm. and i'm hoping in the future uh we can reverse the trend uh so that people can think about this topic seriously yeah i i kind of uh i can definitely see where that's coming from it does seem like it seems like every year it gets a little crazier and a little crazier. It does. Now. It does. Yeah, but hasn't it been like this for a while? I mean, can't you attribute I, some of this giggle factor going back to the Robertson panel? And, and I mean, they've been contactees have been kind of laughed at since the 50s and 60s, haven't they? But it, it's it's exploded now more with media, because and, and, with and, and, media yeah. internet, yeah, TV. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Um, it's amazing how fast. Uh, a piece of information can now travel around the world in, in just a matter of seconds. So, you know, when you have, uh, for example, you know, what was it back in May, you had the disclosure uh, uh, conference here in D.C. Yeah, um, citizens hearing. Yeah. It with Steve Bassett and the media killed it. They ridiculed them, called them space cadets. Every single word you can think of. Uh, it, it was an um, uh, an embarrassment to ufology. Yeah, it? but that that's the media's fault yeah. in a way. Like I I don't know, uh, you know the the six X Congress well, members well, that came have, away well, from that though they they had some interesting changes of uh, heart too though right. So they, they did, but if you look at the audience, the audience were were showing up dressing up like this was a yeah, Roswell yeah, like a, yeah. A Roswell <laughs> conference wearing yeah, space suits and 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 helmets on their head oh. I, and. That is the image that the yeah. media sees. Yeah. They don't see the image of the congressmen up there, the professionals, yeah. uh, the, you know, Stanton Freemans and those guys up there. That's uh, unfortunately they, they concentrated on the wackos that showed up, and and uh, and that's what that's that's the image right now that people see, um, and it's it's and it's and you you just said it about ten minutes ago. It's it's exploding exponentially. You know. Uh, just recently, they had the MUFON Symposium out in Vegas. And, uh, you know, if you look at the photos and their advertisement and their marketing scheme, um, it's something that looked like the National Enquirer. It's just, you know, uh, 
little green men with spacesuits and things like that. I'm look, I'm looking at this. I'm like, whoa, what is going on here? Uh, I think uh, the new director really needs to look at, at the mission and the vision of Mufon and and get back get back on track. Yeah, yeah. It's hard because that probably attracts a lot of uh, attendees and stuff too. It's it's it must be hard to break away from that uh, paradigm. Yeah, well, you know, the the organization has become an enterprise now, yeah. and and for them to survive requires funding. So, um, what they're doing, in my opinion, is that they're they're reaching out to anybody at this point, you yeah. know, uh, to, to keep that membership drive up. Yeah. Um, so they they're not going to weed out the wackos. Uh, it, you know, and lose funding that way. Um, but you know, I I have all hopes for them. Uh, I I wish them the best. Uh, it was a good two years with them, but I need to move forward. And I kind of separated from move on a, a couple of months back. Mm -hmm. But we're doing great. Uh, Aero phenomena is getting some cool cases. Um, you know, a lot of uh, radio interviews and things like that. A couple of episodes with Unsealed. Um, I don't see us going any too much further you know i've gotten a couple offers for tv shows and but i've turned them down um mainly because i already have a career and a profession yeah, yeah um and who knows maybe in the future if i retire i'll do something on the side but, yeah yeah um hmm. yeah it's, it's a good time uh the team members work hard um I, I i try to get as much funding as possible most of my funding comes through book sales and things like that so i can give these guys uh the best equipment possible to do their investigations so have you guys uh have you guys got any uh good pictures or i guess any sort of uh evidence of building your case so far um well ev the evidence comes from witnesses um, and unfortunately, most of the evidence provided to us, we were able to identify it, what it was. I think the closest uh, um, case that we had that required, you know, all hands on deck was the uh, New Mexico case we did a couple of months, uh, months ago. Um, and that was uh, allegedly back in 1947, a UFO crashed in San Augustine. Uh, actually, it was also during the same week as Roswell. So the gentleman out there mailed us uh, some some samples from mm -hmm. pieces of metal and things like that. Um, so uh, we went through the investigative process. Uh, we disclaimed the metal because it was just the uh, chain of custody was just horrible. You know, they they had the metal for for you know ten years, passing it around at various conferences and things like that. Uh, the analysis was was, was skewed, um, but we went out there and he showed us a beam that was also found with with the uh, uh, with the metal out there in the site. And after the investigation, um, which took us about three months, we identified the beam as a, as an aircraft, and we were really confident that what crashed out there was an AT six uh, aircraft from World War Two. Um, and we have the uh, Air Force records to prove that. We have the uh, obituary of the pilot uh, that was killed to prove that. So it all came down to um, a World War II training aircraft crashed out there uh, just a couple years before Roswell. And that possibly was behind the folklore of a UFO that crashed there. Wow. Yeah, um, very cool. So we're not saying, you know, maybe a UFO did crash there. Uh, but the evidence provided to us uh, uh, told us otherwise. So when you said that the results of the, the testing of the metal was, uh, what, did, what did you call it? Um, we call it, uh, uh, you know, when I look at um, metal physical evidence, one of the first things I ask is, okay, I need to know chain of custody. You know, uh, it, wherever you found it, uh, how was it, how was it uh, acquired? How was it dealt with? Um, uh, where did it go for testing? Who had physical contact with it and things like that? Mm -hmm. And from what I understood is, uh, you know, it was just a bunch of people out there um, uh, who unfortunately didn't know what they were doing. They were digging up artifacts. Uh, yeah, they put them in Ziplocs, but they were touching them with bare hands. They were mailing uh, pieces of metal out, you know, and, and coming back to them. They were bringing, taking them to conferences for like three or four years. People were touching them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I couldn't really, you know, from a, let's say from a courtroom perspective, there's no court in law or, 
or no defense attorney that would would accept that as as, as proof of anything. The evidence is tainted. Um, so we had to concentrate on witness interviews and physically going out there to try to find our own metal. Yeah. Um, and and in the background, we were trying to also figure out what else could have happened there besides a UFO. And after months of researching with the National Archives, uh, the U.S. Air Force, um, and a couple of aircraft archaeologists who also identified the beam as as a from an AT-6 aircraft. We were really confident that it was an airplane that crashed there. Hmm. So hi- hypothetically, if you if you did find some metal mm-hmm. that had some characteristics of like basically and made of some element that we don't even know yet, which, which would sure. be almost one of the only ways to prove that it wasn't from this planet. Um, yeah. I mean, if you had evidence like that, would would the mainstream scientific community even accept it? I mean, how would you even have you pictured how that would go down? You would have. OK, first, the first thing, you know, if I did rec- acquire a piece of metal or some type of object and it was vetted and analyzed through a, uh, a reputable lab, you yeah. know, I would lean towards to a university or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, which we have a couple of contacts here in Baltimore. Um, I would probably vet it initially through them first. With, with if if a university uh, or or a credible lab that mm-hmm. does forensics works for let's say the law enforcement or universities, if their analysis uh, leans towards something that's not terrestrial, um, uh, I think that would just be huge in and itself. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, let's go back to the 1947 uh, medal. Uh, that was given to a some paranormal group out of, I believe it was Texas or something, years later. So it was like three or four years later. Um, and that that paranormal group was not accredited to do the, you know, medal analysis things and things like that. Mm-hmm. That's why it was also uh, tainted. discounted, yeah. tainted. Yeah. Yeah. Um, not that they were, you know, I'm not... You know, I'm looking for accreditation, and you just mentioned it's got to be an accredited organization so that it can be accepted by the scientific community. Um, so if we ever reach that part, you know, that, okay, we have metal or a piece of object, uh, we have a credible university or organization that says it's not terrestrial, I think the next step would probably be to hold some type of committee, a hearing amongst uh, professionals in ufology as well as inviting uh, local academia and, and government officials. And that's what I've been doing. You know, yeah. just next month will be my fourth time uh, going to a university to talk about UFOs, um, uh, to talk about, you know, what is UFOs, what isn't UFOs, and things like that. Uh, so the we're taking what I call a full-spectrum approach uh, from the book, from the website, from conferences, to talking like this, going to universities, you name it is to put out the message that something is happening out there. Um, yes, mm-hmm. 95 to 98 percent of everything could be explained. Mm-hmm. That two percent, uh, what is it? Um, nobody is 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 jumping to conclusions saying it's extraterrestrial. But I think uh, there are some serious scientists out there um, that are kind of closet ufologists. They 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 <laughs> don't want to really be out in the open to talk about it. Yeah. But but, yeah. but on the side, they'll tell you it's interesting. Huh. Um, and if you notice, uh, I'm building my credentials by by uh, not only applying but being accepted by these organizations: the Washington Academy of Sciences, yeah, right. Right. the uh, um, the Washington uh, Astronomers, you know, National Capital Astronomers, and things like that. Those organizations have reputations already. Mm-hmm. Um, so as I as I I can't change how they think, but perhaps if I uh, I can shape how they think, you know, by right, being right. part of their organizations. And yeah. slowly, this could be a five, ten year, twenty yeah. year process. Um, so I'm not running into these organizations, the Washington Academy of Sciences. You know, and saying aliens exist, yeah. you know, that's not what I'm doing. But because yeah. uh, they see some of the some of my colleagues are seeing the difference of what aerial phenomena does. They're yeah. saying, wait a minute, this guy has uh, reputable team members that work at NASA, work for the federal government, uh, are scientists and things like that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and so he's building the reputation of an organization that has some serious characters in it and are triaging cases so they don't chase every case out there. Yeah. And that's and I think and that's what the message I'm trying to put out there. Hmm. You know, if you go on my website, uh, you don't see, you know, little green men or or cows, you know, flying stuff like that. Uh, I only provide what the witness provided and things like that. I don't see I don't sensationalize my website um, and things like that. It's I'm trying to make it as basic as possible so that everybody can understand it. It's uh, it's something that we seem to ask all of our guests and, and you kind of already just answered this but so do you think it's been opening opening up then in the last let's say five years even ten years and oh, what's in, in oh, like the this even though it's getting a little crazier the, like the acceptance of this as a genuine investigatable phenomena I, I think okay are you talking like if it's um, can it be investigated from a science perspective? Yeah, yeah. Or like, is it is it opening up in those institutions that you're talking I, about? I I look at it more. Um, it can be, maybe, you know, scientifically investigated. I'm looking at it more from an, an analytical perspective. Um, you can't really investigate scientifically a light in the sky, or uh, or a disc that went zigzag. You know. No, I meant um, more of the acceptance of it being a genuine phenomenon by institutions and scientific communities. Like, I think is it is. That, that's think, opening yeah. up, it seems. I think it is. If, if, um, if universities are reaching out to me, um, you know, you know, for example, next month, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, an astronomy class, a university professor in astronomy class invited me to talk about UFOs. Um, wow. so I, I think that's interesting. Yeah. You know, here yeah. we have a, a science astronomy class uh, inviting uh, a UFO investigator to talk about uh, aerial phenomena and things like that. I think that I think that's huge. Yeah. And I'm yeah. trying, you know, and uh, last month I did it as well with a psychology class. A psychology professor invited me to talk to his psychology class about, I think his subject was the paranormal um, and specifically UFOs. So he found my website and reached out to me, and hmm. I thought that I thought that was huge too. So there is there's some maybe not the university level, but at least at the professor level, um, I think there's a there's a small growing trend. Um, I I don't know what's driving that trend. I do notice that uh, on TV there's a lot of paranormal shows and stuff like that. That's that's kind of exploded in the last couple of years. Oh, that, I know. It I, seems like that, every second show now yeah. is like paranormal, and most of them are terrible. That that might be uh, <laughs> that might be it. I don't know. Um, I, have, I have my own theory on that that it's that it's just more and more people having genuine experiences that that just increase the awareness. It's a little vague and hard to like yeah. you know put your finger on, but like it kind of leads me to my my next point. I was going to say why why do you think that we have the need to prove this not as like not as just yourself or myself but as a culture as a, like i think what's happening is a lot of people they have these experiences and um they almost i think there's like a se separation right there's people that want to prove it and people that are yeah. beginning not to care like i've had a multiple witness multiple sighting experience in in 1990 that kind of like i've kind of already accepted that like i'm not saying it's et or anything for me it could be a you know a black uh black project or some sort of high-tech thing but it was definitely yeah. a craft flying through the sky very odd shape and i saw it with multiple people so for me it's like i was involved in one of the, the sort of the weirdest cases ever in a way um so i don't really i don't know like the proof thing i understand the need for it but i'm almost past that myself because i've seen something i think i think um deep down inside uh humans have a need to explore mm. and 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 expand and want answers and one of those uh, deep down inside questions is are we alone in the universe and uh, and people want answers you know uh, if UFOs or at least you know that small percentage of UFOs are somehow intelligent controlled you know objects from uh, extraterrestrials people want to know you know. Uh, if if they do exist, you know. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Some people want to know if they're a threat. Some people want to know if they're benign. Are mm -hmm. they friendly? You know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a lot of the witnesses that I've talked to are sincere. 
they're genuine people sincere don't want anything don't want publicity they just want answers they saw something strange they couldn't understand uh they knew it's it's not something that they ever seen uh yeah, and they yeah. they uh, you know I'm, I'm hoping to provide them answers yeah um i i unfortunately never experienced anything and so i can never uh you know i, I can't you know all i can do is sympathize for the, per the people who see things yeah, um yeah uh, who knows maybe one day it'll be my turn um but i think i think for the most part people want to answer of work into this website like that elusive black triangle page is is amazing so you've got what i don't know hundreds of photos and yes. sketches like this this conglomeration is that a good word conglomeration or or like collage of of black triangle i mean it's got it's got to be overwhelming for anybody to look at a skeptic or a scientist i mean just the the amount of different uh it looks like these are just from different cases that all kind of point to uh a very uh, real thing going on I, here. I, I, I think I, I'm pretty certain that the okay the black triangle is out there uh, what is it I don't know I'm probably leaning towards more it's probably man-made some classified yeah, yeah, top secret yeah. you know aircraft that's ours I'm not saying that but that's where I'm leaning towards yeah, if you yeah. look at the data yeah um, but you have to be careful with witnesses um, sometimes um, uh, they tend to, they, you know, the eyes and human perspective are make really bad witnesses. They'll tell you something is uh, the size of a football field. And when you ask them, well, how do you know it was the size of a football field? <laughs> if you don't know the altitude or, or something else to compare with. Um, uh, I did a really good test, kind of a uh, test thing one day with, uh, with my own investigators. Um, I put a... Uh, a photo of a, uh, I think it was a yeah, triangle UFO on a big screen for about 10 seconds. And I, you know, I went on with my presentation and about two hours later, I said, hey guys, I need you to go back and draw that black triangle that I showed you two hours ago. I had 10 investigators drew me 10 different black triangles. So as you can see, the mind sometimes just, you know, <laughs> wants to draw whatever they want to draw. Yeah. And and yeah. they all got it wrong. Yeah. But uh <laughs> but uh the black triangle phenomena um is real. It's happening. Uh, I've gotten uh personally a lot of cases in this area about black triangles. Uh you know, and generally they're all the same, you know, uh, black isosceles triangle, uh pulsating red light. Um uh so something is out there's flying, you know. I don't know what it is. If it's man-made, probably 5, 10, 20 years from now, it'll be declassified and we'll be like, oh, yeah, that's what it was. Um, yeah, they always seem to be moving real slow, I think, too, eh? Yeah. Some people have, have uh, uh, identified, not identified, but um, described them as possibly uh, airships, you know, balloons. Right. Um, you know, giant black blimps and things like that. Um, so, you know, one, the only question I have is, you know, I get a lot of these black triangle reports in Maryland, but I, I tend to get them in restricted airspace, you know, over Camp David, where the president, uh, his retreat is, um, close to Andrews Air Force Base. Um, so these are really, DC is a really, really highly restricted airspace. Uh, you, you know, nothing can fly there with, you know, special permissions and things yeah, like that. Yeah. 
Uh, so I don't, you know, either it's man-made because it has permission or it's something else that is there, you know, cloaked or not cloaked, but uh, uh, it's defeating some type of radar. Yeah, but, right. Like, yeah. But that's speculation. Mm. See, the, the reason I think it might not be uh, brought to light even in, in five or 10, 20 years, and, unless uh, the technology that's flying that starts flying other things too that, that come out, um, yeah. or if they come out with that technology as a new technology and then this thing's unveiled or something. But I mean, it's obviously flying with different propulsion systems and it's silent, it's slow yeah. or faster. You know, there's, it seems like it's made from something a little bit different than our conventional craft. So, Yeah, I've been doing some research out here in Easton, I think it's Easton, Maryland. Uh, it's a um, it's a defense contractor who's uh, building uh, muffler systems for uh, VTOL aircraft, vertical takeoff aircraft, mm -hmm. um, and they're doing a lot of classified work. Uh, I'm trying to get it on the open source, but they're doing some work on on propulsion systems that are rendered silent for for large aircraft. So. Not that that's what they're doing is is the black triangles, but uh, if you put the, all the pieces together, yeah, you know, Maryland it's has feasible, yeah. Maryland has maybe two thousand defense contractor facilities. That's just Maryland alone. Wow. They're all working on their little top secret wow. things. Yeah, uh, we've got yeah. NSA up here on the block. We got DIA right here down the block. We got Andrews Air Force Base around the corner. Fort Meade over here. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, you know, just Aberdeen Proving Ground where they're testing weapon systems. So Maryland is very heavy, uh, a military defense industry. Um, so there's a lot of stuff out here flying. <laughs> and you still, and still haven't managed to see nothing. <laughs> yeah. For, well, some no, reason they all come out, all, for some yeah. reason, they all come out at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's no, rarely any UFO reports a day. <laughs> So, but in the in the back of your head, like, do you what what is your um, I suppose what would your opinion be on the extraterrestrial extraterrestrial hypothesis? Do you think they're all man made, or do you think that we're we're legitimately maybe being observed by by uh, aliens? I guess, for lack of a better term. That's I would that you know, as a scientist, planetary scientist. Now I'm talking as a planetary scientist and a guy who studies some astrophysics. Um, space is huge. Um, and interstellar travel uh, is very difficult. And for uh, for a civilization to to have visited here would have to be traveling in, in a some type of uh, spacecraft that that uh, could defeat or travel at enormous speeds to get here in some some uh, some remotely small amount of time, or else they would have been traveling for millions of years. Um, to uh, they're already here, you know, and they've been here. That's another possibility. Um, and then you start leaning towards fringe science. People start talking about interstellar travel, wormholes, and things like that. Um, my personal belief is um, I think extraterrestrial life exists somewhere in the universe. There's probably no doubt about that. Uh, it's a very large universe. At least the observable universe is big. Um, and I believe that there's something out there. Now, if they're visiting here, that's a whole different story. Um, I personally have not seen the proof. Um, uh, maybe it's out there. Maybe I just have seen it. Uh, people have seen things uh, that I think they've seen it. I'm, not, you know, very credible people. I don't think they're crazy. I've seen allegedly uh, greys or extraterrestrials. Um, but uh, I can't. You know, I can't say as a scientist myself, I think either they visited here before um, and are still here. Um, and if they are visiting, their their technology must be way beyond anything we could ever comprehend. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes I don't wonder, too, if like um, if to some to to some to to some different entities, reality, I suppose you would yeah. say if, you know, like if you took our 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 ver vision of time and compared mm -hmm. it to like a mayfly where to to a mayfly like a week is an eternity or a yeah. month or a year you know maybe a, maybe a couple hundred thousand years is nothing to to a different sort of life form to a being made of light uh, yeah no, oh light yeah I've, I've, yeah i've heard it all um 
I, when I look, you know, people all the time, you know, I get thousands of emails, uh, phone calls. People want to talk about interstellar travel, wormholes and things like that. Um, I always I always respond. I, I'm not, I, I never try to be the skeptic, but I always respond. Hey, wormholes, black, you know, all those things are things that we as a human race invented, you know, those terms and those hypotheses and those theories um, for an extraterrestrial, let's say, you know, 13 billion years, 13 billion light years away, uh, for them to come up with those same terms and terminology and things like that and those hypotheses uh, would be no different from me saying, well, then they must have invented Apple Pie and the, and the iPhone too, uh, things that we, invent, you know, humans invented. Uh, so I don't think, my personal opinion is, is if extraterrestrials exist or if they have spacecraft uh, that can travel at those speeds or in those distances. I don't know what it would look like. I don't know what to look for. It would be something way behind what our human imagination can think, could ever ponder. Uh, you, you, who knows? You just said it. It could be a light beam. You know. Yeah. <laughs> who I, knows? I would think it'd be more likely that it'd be mechanical. <laughs> who, who, who? You know. Who's to say it can be a bullet, a jello? You know. I don't know what another life form would look like um i get a lot of these pictures of grays with big heads and two eyes two arms and two legs uh i immediately look at those and oh those look like almost like humans just with big heads yeah uh so for other planets you know or the galaxies uh for a uh an entity or or a biological to to you know through processes of evolution to to have two arms, two legs, two eyes, things like what humans look like, the chances are one in a gazillion. Um, uh, the, the evolutionary processes would have to be almost identical uh, with Earth, you know, for for a species to to evolve like what we look like. Um, you know, just on our planet alone, there's millions of species. Um, so th that those odds are very high. Um, that's why I always lean towards, well, maybe they were already here and they've always been here and they've just been evolving with us. Hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to get back to your, uh, your intelligence background a little bit because, uh, I can understand why some of the UFO community, you know, thinks you're a spook or something like that, because you've got this intelligence background yet. You're not a whistleblower. Sure. You know, you're not coming from the whistleblower angle. You're coming from a, an angle where you want to research nuts and bolts from a scientific perspective, mm -hmm. but you don't really want to get bogged down with uh, government conspiracies and the secret space program yeah. and contactees and all that stuff. But since you have that background, you must have realized a little bit of how things could easily be kept secret in a compartment of, uh, you know, uh, you know, of, of the government or of the intelligence agency. So you still don't think that there's any uh, strings being pulled on the secret on the, you know, covering this thing up? I personally think that perhaps maybe a few dozen, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 years ago when the government had some interest in UFOs, um, that they did study this phenomena in a classified setting, yeah. and perhaps some of the stuff is still classified. Right. Uh, mainly because it hasn't reached its declassification uh, year yet. Yeah. Um, and things, you know, things have expiration dates. You know, they don't just declassify anything because we want it declassified. Um, some things declassify 25, 50 years down the road for re several reasons. Um, I personally don't. Th my personal opinion is I don't think. Uh, that Uncle Sam is is really uh, looking into this phenomena. Uh, other governments might, you know, uh, you know, up in the UK, France, and things like that are are looking at this. We have a lot of problems here to deal with, um, <laughs> from the economy all the way to, you know. Yeah, uh, but what, what what about not Uncle Sam, but but his. Uh you know his re his redheaded stepchild in in the private sector corporate credit oh, community. Oh, I, I would know? I would totally lean towards more that the industrial defense mm -hmm. complex is probably more interested in UFOs. And if a UFO did crash uh, here years ago, um, they probably have the technology, not the government. Yeah, right. Um, yeah. Because it's it's a huge benefit uh, to keep that that. Uh, that a proprietary stuff, you know, close hold yeah, for, yeah. for co competitive reasons, you know, Microwaves and money and, and things like that. iPhones. 
Um, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Who knows? You know, uh, but back to your question, um, you know, I don't, I've, you know, I've been in the intelligence community since 94. So we're going on almost 20 years now. Um, and, you know, I've done signals intelligence, counterintelligence, human intelligence, uh, a little bit of everything. Never really came across anything about UFOs <laughs> or extraterrestrials. Not that I was really looking, but um, compartmentation, um, you know, some things uh, do, you know, can be held secrets. A lot of things tend to leak. Um, I think if aliens exist, uh, I don't think that secret could be held for that long. Right. And if and if aliens did exist, um, it would probably be multiple governments involved, and not the just not just the United States. So it would be more like a worldwide conspiracy of of governments uh, close, you know, holding that information close hold. Yeah, and I can't see uh, I can't see the the Yankees and the Ruskies getting along that well. Yeah, you know, I you know, people always lean towards, oh, the president must know he's got that secret book of whatever. Uh I I don't think I don't you know I don't think presidents are briefed on extraterrestrials, you know. I think you're right, defense contractors, maybe the military uh complexes and things like that, the Pentagon, I don't know. Um, but uh you know, if you look at what technologies that we have right now yeah we've we've gotten long ways in 20 30 years but it's 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 really nothing that spectacular you know yeah we've got iphones um and we've got these cool mics and laptops and stuff like that but i also think that human you know we've got a lot of smart engineers coming out of colleges and 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 just thinking up crazy stuff yeah just just to six you know i was reading the news this morning this 16 year old kid in college uh I might have developed a, a new technology to detect cancer. You know, come on. He's not extraterrestrial, right? Yeah. I hope not. <laughs> he's an indigo child. <laughs> yeah, he's just a smart kid. You know, uh, and we have a lot of smart people out there just inventing things that are just crazy. You know, you have DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Program office. Just they're looking at technologies that are 50 years down the road. You know, they don't care about what what, you know, we want next year they're looking at things 50 years down the road um so they hire a lot of smart people with with triple phds and things like that uh to come up with the next stealth bomber and stuff like that what do you think about um i guess to just to go off topic here for a minute what are your thoughts do you think um the coming like people talking about us merging with our technology or just even AI and the possibility of that, do you think that will help to shed any light on ufology? Or I, even in a, in a second part, um, is, is technology, do you, do you think, was that something that any intelligent species, any place in the universe would come up with eventually? I think um, technology will only go so far. Um, I don't know what the theory is, but someone, there was a theory that said that by, I think they said 2060, I'd have to look it up and give it to you guys, but they said by 2060, uh, humans would have, would have reached uh, at the capacity where they can't really invent anything else uh, to improve their lives technologically. And I was, I, man, I forgot the name of the article. Um, so that would mean perhaps another civilization out there would have reached uh, a, 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 uh, a capacity, you know, of, of what they can invent. Yeah. Um, hmm. Especially if they're space traveling, you know, space faring uh, uh, civilizations. You could, you could only uh, bring so much with you on an on a interstellar trip um, and you need to take care of that equipment. You know, it's just like us going to the moon and stuff like that. You, you know, uh, you can't build things out of nothing when, when you're uh, in a spacecraft. So... If a spacecraft, let's say, left Proxima Centauri, whatever, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, and it reaches here 75 years later to the extraterrestrials, that that's that equipment's probably ancient, you know, 75 years yeah, old for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> It'd be like us trying to get to Key West in a, yeah. in a 52 Chevy. You know? <laughs> um, so they'd have, I, I personally think if they do exist, they'd have to travel at, at some amazing speeds. Hmm. To get here, you know, in life, in some type of lifetime. 
Well, I want to live to at least half of that, uh, <laughs> half the time it takes for us to reach our maximum uh, capacity for invention. I mean, imagine just another 20 years. Like, we're living in such fascinating times. I just, I'm constantly just uh, astounded at, at what's happening to our yeah, but I culture. think we it, we have to be careful. You know, all it takes is a really good solar flare, and we're back in the stone yeah, age. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, you got to get one of those. What are those boxes called? A Faraday cage. A Faraday cage. Yeah, yeah. We should we should make those and sell them. Yeah. We should. Yeah. Well, we should make a Faraday cage around the igloo so that if anyone has yeah. a ham radio, they can still listen to the Grab America show. <laughs> well, I don't know if a ham radio will go through a Faraday cage. I don't. I don't think so. Nothing much will go through. Well, you can except take for it remote out. You viewing. Can take it out after the thing's over. Yeah, that's true. You could you could remote view into a Faraday cage. I bet. <laughs> we won't, we won't go there. So, do you have anything else that you want to you want to mention at all, or anything else that you've got coming up in the in the future? Um, Are you going to any conferences? Yeah we, we, yeah, we got a bunch of conferences coming up. We have uh, next week, I'll be talking at the National Capital Area Skeptics uh, annual meeting. And then a couple weeks after that, at the uh, MUFON Pennsylvania Conference, their large annual conference in the East Coast. Um, Halloween, I'll be talking at Mysteries of Space, which is a big, uh, it's DC's biggest UFO conference held annually wow and i think that's it for the rest of the year and you know some some uh uh book signings here and then in october we're we're uh, heading out to uh utah to investigate the skinwalker ranch uh, oh that'll be good so we're going to be out there for three days for initial recon and then go back out in january is that and bigelow's that, place that that yeah it was bigelow's place so it we're, was we'll be out. it was or it is it's technically, according to the Utah's um, uh, tax assessor, oh. uh, the property, I did the research, the property is still under Bigelow's estate, but it's now leased to a private uh, private rancher. And it, it's it's a ranch now again, you know, with cows oh, and everything. Wow. Cows with, uh, with uh, maybe Three some eyes. men in yeah. black or security <laughs> guards out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, I, and I contacted John Alexander, who told me there's oh. nothing going on over there. Yeah. And, and I, I said, well, why? There's a bunch of guys with machine guns and there's sent you know infrared sensors yeah. over there <laughs> well did you see the joe rogan uh show at all the yeah, joe rogan, yeah. yeah he, he yes. went there and they had all those like keep out and see or private property signs like 20 of them in the in the driveway but nothing really uh happened to them i don't think so well be, you know, well it's like ufos um uh uh activities happen you know every couple of years it's you know and so when somebody says oh my god there's so much activity going on in Skinwalker Ranch, it's something like 30 things that happen, but spanned out 30 or 40 years. So we're, you know, for us to go out there, it's like a drive-by, you know, the likelihood that we'll see something is, you know, zero. Um, but we have to go out there and investigate. You know, I tell my guys, you can't point a camera at something, say there's something fishy going on there. That's not an investigation, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to go out there and <laughs> talk to people and, and you know, put some night vision cameras out there for a couple of days and then go back again and then go back again, stuff like that. So that's in October. That'll be fun. Yeah, that'll be, yeah. uh, we're going during the, uh, I think it's a full moon. So the werewolf might come out. Oh, nice. <laughs> Chuka, chupacabra. The chupacabra. Yeah. Uh, what do you um, think about, um, ancient aliens and things like that? And do you think that shows like that are, are better for, for what we're trying to do? Or do you think they're, they're worse? Well, I like the shows, but they're still theories. You know, um, you know, I'll, I I don't like it when they say, "Oh my God, that they couldn't have built that that pyramid, so it had to be extraterrestrials." You know, give me a break. Come on, you put two thousand people together, they'll build something. Yeah, um, or, or they, you know, they know how to <laughs> levitate things with sound. <laughs> um, but uh, the shows are okay. I think I really want to lean towards. Uh, the current stuff um, you know I haven't gotten any really cases that are that you know about ancient aliens and things like that but uh, for historical purposes for researching and things like that I always like to look at that stuff um, but they don't shape the investigations mm -hmm. um, do you look into things like um, like if meteorites come to earth like I think the latest that came out the other day was some British scientists are saying they've found 
alien life in a meteorite like do you guys are you guys interested in that at all at all or is it strictly just uh no UFOs? I, as uh you know for me personally i like to look at that stuff because that's what i studied so i'm always looking at uh nasa websites astrobiology websites uh not necessarily for ufo investigations but it's, it's my personal endeavor you know i like to look at that stuff so i'm always looking at that stuff you know uh you know, American Meteor Society website, for example, is a great website I go to all the time uh, to look for meteor activity, uh, any research going on regarding extraterrestrial life and stuff like that. I'm always looking at that kind of stuff. Um, uh, they're not necessarily go hand in hand together with nuts and bolts UFO investigations, mm -hmm. but it's something that as an investigator is, is I should always be looking at that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, it's actual evidence you can hold in your hand. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm always out there, you know, when I'm in New Mexico or wherever, I'm always keeping my eye open for a meteorite or something, you know. What something. about like Xeno archaeology? I kind of stay away from that. I stay away from that cryptozoology and all that stuff. Um, I want to stick to uh, nuts and bolts reports, uh, investigations. Very rarely do I do uh, crop circles or... Uh, uh, cryptozoology, those type of reports and things like that. Even alien abductions, I've kind of stay away from, you know, unless it's recent, uh, a relatively stable witness. Um, I've noticed that a lot of cases I've done about abductions, uh, people might need mental health, you know, and I'm not a psychologist. Uh, so I want to stick to nuts and bolts investigations. I look at that stuff, you know, um, uh, you know, for, you know, for research, but it necessarily, it's not something I want to concentrate on. Hmm. Well, I think, uh, you know, we should probably start wrapping it up here. We know you've, uh, you got to go here too. And, um, sure. if there's anything else you want to mention and we'll, we'll link to all that, uh, like your book and your website and Just, a lot of those other things, uh, in the show notes. Yeah. You know, um, I like to tell everybody, keep an open mind. Uh, you know, my group is made up of a, a, uh, a spectrum of beliefs I've got from skeptics to non-believers um, and to those that are in the middle. Uh, and that makes for a great team uh, for, for debating amongst each other about, about this phenomena. Mm -hmm. uh, we want to stick to uh, nuts and bolts investigations. If that's what somebody's interested in, uh, visit our website. Um, more importantly, if people are interested in investigating this kind of stuff, uh, the website is full of lots of resources. You know, there's links to uh, the same resources we use for investigating weathers, meteors, or, or space phenomena. So if anybody's ever interested in, in, in investigating UFOs, uh, I think we have a great website of resources that they can uh, look at and challenge themselves. Um, and just, you know, just keep an open mind uh, and, and that, you know, and hopefully, you know, you guys can come down to a book signing or whatever. Um, and we'll just keep evolving. The website will keep changing. We'll add new information. Uh, as things become obsolete, we'll delete them. Um, and yeah, I just want to thank you for having me on board. Yeah, no, thank you. And your, your website, I just want to say again, is really clean and easy to navigate. And it's a really good uh, resource and really nice and nice and clear. Lots of photos, lots of definitions. It's, it's great. And hopefully uh, we can bump into you in a conference too one day. And, or maybe we'll have you back on after your uh, Skinwalker investigation. Awesome. Just mm -hmm. uh, send me your, uh, your address and I'll shoot the book out to you guys. chat with uh, Antonio Paris. What'd you think of that, Grab? That was uh, that was really good. Yeah, I, I enjoyed that. Yeah, he kind of goes against some of your uh, some of your side, but he's got what you have to admit. What he's doing is good work. Like, oh yeah, he, he makes it a lot easier for these scientific people and and societies to to accept. Yeah, I think it's going to be very very important in the future for for organizations like him to 
kind of make some, uh, kind of build some pillars of uh, legitimate scientific research. Yeah. Foundation, buddy. Foundation. That's the word I was looking yeah, for. Can't build a house without a strong foundation. <laughs> so his website's aerial-phenomena.org. I just want to say that before I forget. Yeah, and he's at Aerial Phenomena on Twitter, and uh, I'm sure he's got a Facebook page as well. I will take a look for it so we can link to it in the show notes. It's really, it's really a cool website, like I said many times. But the the whole black triangle thing with all those pictures of the lights and the sketches and all that—it's just really kind of overwhelming the amount of uh, of data on that. Yeah, I think, like I say, I think those things are black ops for sure. Yeah, yeah, I I tend to agree, but Maybe I think there Russian. was. I think it's more than just black ops, so. Green ops? Little green ops. <laughs> Little green ops. <laughs> uh, speaking of green, we're going to have Kevin Booth on <laughs> <laughs> next week. Good segue. Yeah, you like that? Yeah, that was very good. So Kev- Kevin Ruins Booth's fasting, when you right? talk he's, about it. He's but. talking about the uh, the drug war and uh, cannabis oil. He's He's got some fascinating stuff. Yeah, his... Uh, well, his first first uh, movie, Ameri- the, yeah, American Drug War One came out in two thousand seven. I think that was American Drug War, uh, the Last White Hope. The Last White Hope. Yeah, yeah, it's like got a lot of coke, oh, cocaine. That, I don't know if it was white as in that or white. Yeah, as where the money's or... going. Oh. And then his latest is American Drug War Two: Cannabis Destiny, which is. Um, cannabis oil and things like this becoming becoming cures for this and that. Yeah, we've talked about some of that stuff on previous episodes and it's going to be exciting to have him on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's It'll be great to talk to him. So I'm really looking forward to that. I'm pretty excited to, to pick his brain for a couple hours. So um, if you have any questions for him, by all means, uh, email us. Uh, my email is graham at grimerica.com, G-R-A-H-A-M at grimerica.com yeah and i'm darren at grimerica.com um and as always hate mail goes to feedback at grimerica.ca nobody um, reads that yeah no one reads that so send away <laughs> and um of course we're at grimerica on twitter and uh grimerica on facebook you can like us there and um um, so as always, Graham will uh, have everything in the show notes, all the links, all that good stuff, um, all the music you heard in this episode. I think that's about all I got. Do you got anything else you want to throw in, Graham? No, that's it, man. I'm just looking forward to the next uh, episode. All right. We'll see you guys next week.
Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And yet I ask you, is not an alien force already among us? What could be more alien to the universal aspirations of our peoples than war and the threat? And more secure for you and your children. I couldn't help at one point in my discussions with privately with General Secretary Gorbachev. When you stop to think that we're all God's children wherever we may live in the world, I couldn't help but say to him, just think how easy his task and mine might be in these meetings that we held if suddenly there was a threat to this world from some other species from another planet uh, outside in the universe. We'd forget all the little local differences that we have between our countries and we would find out once and for all that we really are all human beings here on this earth together.